The 2022 World Cup is coming to the Middle East. How did this tiny country called Qatar land the biggest competition in world sports? I'm going to meet the people behind the bid. Can you guarantee that the 2022 World Cup was won fairly by Qatar? I'm going to see the stadiums. It's the Bernabeu, it's New Camp scale in Qatar and talk to the workers who are building them. I don't have nothing in my pocket, not even 20 or 50 dollars. What we do know is that, of course, there are workers who are dying in Qatar. There's this number that's floating around about how many workers have died. Can, uh, you, answer, can you answer that question? I played in two World Cups, coached at a third, but this <laughs> is going to be something very different. <laughs> Qatar, we know, has a very strict policy around alcohol, but alcohol is absolutely vital for any sporting competition. Can this tiny conservative country host the world's biggest party? We're going to find out. The winner to organise the 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. Qatar has won a World Cup. I don't think anybody will ever on that day forget. The response was one of shock. How did Qatar win this tournament? Did they win it fairly? And why? Why did Qatar want this tournament? The exploitation of people. The workers have not enjoyed the same simple rights that we enjoy in this country. Where are the fan parts going to be? Where are the fans going to stay? They don't tolerate misbehaviour. They don't tolerate alcohol. They don't tolerate this. They don't tolerate that. All these questions that we've heard need answering. Now it's Qatar's time to deliver on a world stage and I'm intrigued to go over there to work out where they're up to. A few fans might not know where Qatar is. The answer? On the coast of the Arabian Peninsula, east of Saudi Arabia, west of Dubai. It's a seven hour flight from the UK and the three hour time difference will guarantee prime time viewing in Europe and Asia. I've been over there in training camps for Manchester United. I've witnessed world-class facilities. However, I've not been to visit the stadiums. I've not been to the camps where the workers live. My view is I'm going to go there and ask the questions and hope that we get the right answers. We're here in Doha, the capital city of Qatar, with the Persian Gulf behind us. The world is in a focus, its whole attention on this small Middle Eastern country, the smallest ever nation to host a World Cup, the first ever Muslim country to host a World Cup. What a challenge they have. Qatar is spending just short of £400 million a week preparing for the World Cup. This country is not short of cash. To our left, the liquefied gas fields is the money machine for Qatar. There is 200 years of resources left in those gas fields. That means that Qatar will have incredible wealth and resource for a long, long time to come. Like a lot of other Middle Eastern states, Qatar is pouring money into football. You think of the investment from Qatar into Paris Saint-Germain, obviously the relationship with Barcelona. Uh, you now think about the investment into the World Cup. The Middle East states recognise football as something that can give them international credibility, a seat at the table. I think gone are the days where you could just host a football tournament without being questioned. When it was announced that Qatar had won the World Cup, you just straight away thought of corruption, blatter, payoffs. There are people delving left, right and centre, people trying their damnedest to prove that this is a corrupt World Cup, this is a bought World Cup. Well, the whole bidding process was very murky. More than half of the, the voters at the time have some sort of question mark over their reputations. There was all sorts of collusion and deals going on all around the place. There have been many investigations, and the investigations found wrongdoing against many bids. What many say is Qatar was actually doing it on a you know, different level in terms of these big government deals that, that were going on, although ultimately there was no 
corruption proven. I've been invited over here to produce a documentary on the Qatar World Cup by the Qatar government. It was on the basis that nothing's off boundaries. Whatever we see, we can put in. Whatever we get, material-wise, we can put in. If we're not comfortable with anything, we can take it out. We have to ask the tough questions. High-ranking officials in football have fallen. They have been proven to be corrupt, but no one yet has landed a punch on this tiny country. We're on our way now to see the CEO of World Cup Qatar 2022, Nasser Al Qatar, to ask him some questions. Look, the whole issue of the allegations of corruption obviously is frustrating. We've been uh, accused publicly without a shred of evidence. We've been uh, considered guilty without a shred of evidence. As you know, in a court of law, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. We haven't been offered um, that courtesy. We had the best bid, and it was time. It was time for the Middle East to have a World Cup. So yes, I guarantee you that we won this bit fair and square. Football was and has been proven to be corrupt at the highest level. You must understand why people ask, are asking the questions that they are. Every time something happens and, 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 and there's an allusion to corruption, it's always Qatar 2022. Garcia uh, investigation, the Swiss public prosecutor investigation, the Department of Justice and the FBI investigated over several years. So I think after 10 years of being accused and of allegations and nothing has come out, I think people should really be ashamed of themselves at this stage. Michel Platini was arrested. Yes, and this is a case in point. So Michel Platini was arrested. He was questioned about uh, his time in FIFA. He was questioned about UEFA. He was questioned about Russia 2018. But people still want to focus on Qatar 2022. And it's this bias that's frustrating. The controversy is going to rage on. But having won the World Cup, can they deliver it? So security, delivery of stadiums, transport, making sure that the, the playing surfaces are of a high enough quality. Hassan al Tawada is Mr World Cup, really, for Qatar. The World Cup is an absolutely sensational tournament and he's the man in charge of delivering it. Let's have a look at these stadiums because I have to say, if I stand back and look at them, they're yep. absolutely, they're world class. Here, this stadium has been inspired by the shipping cargoes, or container, shipping containers. This has been inspired by the Arabic cap that we wear. What's the cost of the stadia for this tournament? Total is about 6.5, 6.6 billion dollars uh, for all the stadiums and including the training sites as well. You spent some money, haven't you? Listen, you're going to host a football tournament. Let's be very honest and very frank. Hosting these major tournaments costs. We're on our way to the stadium that's going to hold the opening game of the World Cup and the final. Going to the stadium where England are going to lift the World Cup. This stadium will be absolutely, it'll be memorable. Lusail Stadium will hold 80,000 fans. It's costing a billion pounds alone. And it's been designed by Foster and Partners of London. You'll notice this is not a flat roofed symmetrical bowl. Foster and Partners designed this beautiful dip and that dip translates throughout the entire facade in three dimensions. And do you know why he did that? Just because his pencil just went like that on the page. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, honestly. He just sat there thinking, I'll just put a bit of a curve in. All right, that's it. There you go, there's another, there's another 50 million. Hello, are you okay? The bulk of the workforce are obviously from uh, South Asia, uh, as you've seen from the number of guys you've chatted with as we walked there. In total, we're looking at 5,000 people at the moment. We'll try and get out on the terraces, if you like. I come from a family of Liverpool supporters, so oh. I'm getting a lot of stick for today. It's already now taking shape and looking like a stadium. It's the Bernabeu, it's New Camp scale, Wembley. This is it in Qatar. Maybe the most amazing thing about La Salle Stadium is what happens afterwards. Qatar don't want these stadiums to become white elephants. So when the football finishes, they'll tear up the pitch, donate the spare seats to developing countries and turn the space into a community centre, college and clinic. This stadium has taken years to construct and it'll be used for four weeks. Final of the Qatar World Cup, the players will be lined up exactly where I'm here now. 
heading out there into a cauldron. As cauldrons go, this one should be cool. Not only do all stadiums have air conditioning, but the whole tournament's been moved to November and December. That was after the bid was successful. That'll mean some disruption to the domestic season in Europe. FIFA clearly overlooked the fact there was a big warning on heat in the inspection report because you can cool stadiums, but the rest of the country is going to be pretty hot if you hold it in uh, June and July. So it makes a lot of sense to hold it late in the year. And I think we can cope with maybe a few months of disruption for one season to give a different part of the world a chance to host the World Cup. The heat will not be a problem for the players and fans. But what about the workers who are building these stadiums? What is the temperature that you stop at? Uh, it is a combination of, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 48 degrees Celsius, and I think it was a 50 or 60 percent humidity. 48 degrees Celsius is, I mean, that's right. You can't line it in the pool, let no, alone no, work no. it. There's no skirting around the issue. It's the desert, yeah. and and it gets it gets challenging. So I just posted the shot of the stadium wow. where we were. And it's incredible, the animosity, actually, in terms of the replies. You know, have you found any dead migrant workers' bodies? How many died building this one? Please don't support this abomination of a spectacle. It's incredible, the sort of negative perception, hostility that exists against this tournament. Um, and these are people, actually, not just from the UK. These are people from sort of all around the world that are responding. The stadiums that those hundreds of thousands of fans, millions of fans are going to go into and enjoy, there has been a cost along the way. There has been suffering. The workers have not enjoyed the same simple rights that we enjoy. When did you last see your children? Two years back. You've not seen them for three years? Qatar is one of the richest countries in the world. But of the three million people here, 90% are migrant workers. We absolutely know in life that where you're born has an impact upon your quality of life. And if you think about a lot of the migrant worker population that come to Qatar, it's the same the story every single time. I've left my family, I come over here, and I send money back to them every month so that they can live a more comfortable life. And it's a terrible choice to have to make between looking after your family and leaving them. This is a global problem. I think the real issue for Qatar is that they've got a tournament that goes above and beyond and the world is looking at them and we're looking at them. I think it's critical that people are treated properly full stop all over the world in employment. I was a representative of the union, the PFA. I was part of a group of players who questioned whether we should go on strike. So I can't sit here now and say, as a football person, that it's right that people don't get treated right in employment. And that is one of the major concerns and issues that Qatar has to deal with. Nine years since the World Cup's awarded, we still have workers that are paid too little, sometimes not paid at all. We have workers that live and work in very difficult conditions. We have workers that are not able to freely change jobs. Extortionate agents fees uh, is a big, big problem. A worker will have to pay for the rights to get that job. Do you believe improvements are being made, that they are going to get there to the standards that Amnesty International and other internationally recognised bodies want? You know, we have seen, for example, a temporary minimum wage, and there's a new scheme that has been put in place to claim back agents fees. We've seen some progress but implementation is patchy, and, and the result of that is that many, many workers are still vulnerable to abuse. You know, workers' conditions over here are poor. Workers' salaries are poor. It needs to change. If football can help drive that change, it will have been definitely worthwhile. We've done a lot of work that will lead into changes. Um, one is the minimum wage. What I can tell you is that the minimum wage will definitely go up from the current temporary minimum wage. Is it going to be a significant increase? More than 50%. There will be more than a 50% increase to the minimum wage paid to every single migrant worker in Qatar. Permanent non-discriminatory minimum wage should be adopted into law. That's where we're at. Qatar is being driven to improve its workers' salaries, but there is still a lot to do. I mean, look, when you read the Amnesty International report, 
Despite nascent reform, such labour abuse continues on a significant scale today. Workers continue to be vulnerable to serious abuse, includes forced labour and restrictions on freedom of movement. But I can tell you one thing, our commitment and dedication mm. to the health, safety and security of everybody working in the country and working on our projects is of the utmost priority. Do all workers have their own passports? In the World Cup, we don't have a case of workers not holding, you know, not having their passports. We had to focus on priorities. You had to prioritize and you had to plan. Our first priority was accommodation, ensuring that the people lived in safe accommodation. And let me speak very honestly, you know, people, people lived in horrendous circumstances and a horrendous, horrendous environment before. In Qatar? In Qatar, you had people that lived in horrible, 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 unacceptable conditions. Our first focus was to ensure that people's accommodations were improved. We're seeing the workers' accommodation today. That's something that I'm interested to see. Well, there, there, there's accommodation. It's not pleasant. It looks like a prison. According to Qatar, Challenger City is five-star workers' accommodation. Food and lodging is free. There's a recreation room and a mosque. It's home to 6,000 workers, many of whom are building the nearby Al Rayyan Stadium. Supervisor Hibber and Head of Workers' Welfare Mahmoud showed me around. Are you personally comfortable with the standard that you see in Qatar at the moment? The situation is not perfect, uh, no doubt, but it's certainly a lot better than it was. Can so we see the accommodation? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Would you like to go to the first floor? Can we go to no, the it's, door? it's fine, yeah, yeah. OK. I wanted to meet some workers. How many workers actually are there per room? Four. You've got four men sharing a room. Hi. What are they actually like to live in? Hi. This one's yours? Yes. Hi. How are you? Are you okay? Good to see you, okay? Uh, fine. You working at the Al Ryan Stadium? Uh, Al Ryan yes, Stadium. Stadium. Okay. Your break, break today? Break? You have a day off or? Night. Night. Night, night. or oh, night. 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 night shift. Oh, okay. Oh. When I went inside the accommodation, a sadness just goes right through your body. I looked at those two men and just thought, They've lived there every day for two years. Is this your, like your, that very small Week, space with a, a locker, which I would only describe as a locker you would get in your, at school, a bed that's obviously very small, a space that has no privacy, and to thinking that's your existence for one year, four years, six years, eight years, is... I find it really difficult, it's difficult. Most of the workforce that are building the stadiums are from South Asia, but some, like these lads, come from Gardner. How long have you been in Qatar? Uh, two years. Two years? Who has children? Sure. Yeah. Hand up. When did you last see your children? Two years back. You've not seen them for three years? Yeah, two years now. I haven't seen them. <sighs> Tough, eh? And the money that you earn, is it, is it getting better or is it the same? Uh, you know, money is very terrible. The money's terribly. Yes, $250. $250 per week? Per month. Per month? Yes, yes. I don't have nothing in my pocket. <laughs> two years. Best are two years, not even $20 or $50. Do you have your passports? They, you keep them, yeah? Yeah, we have our passports. Yeah. And can you leave the job whenever you want? No. no, no, no. You can't? Yes. No, you can't. You cannot leave? Yeah. But you have your passport, why can't you leave? Well, the company has to release you because you are under them, because they are your sponsor. And if they don't release you, you cannot get any opportunity anywhere in Qatar. So you, you can leave to go back to Ghana, but yeah. you cannot leave this job to go to another job? Yeah, yeah. How much did it cost to come over? Cost, some of us paid about 5,000, What, 5,000 what? Real? Yeah. 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 So like $1,000 maybe? No, 2,000, 3,000 like that. Why do you pay that much? Why? No, no, no. The, the, the agents. agents. Your agents? Yeah, yeah the agents. You have, you have agents charging you to come over here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not a company. It's agents. not a company. They're our agents. But they said that you can, they can claim your agents' money back? No. I've just been told that the agents' money can be claimed back. No. We have, we, we have the discussed day. about this for the past two years, yeah. but no, we have not seen anything like Nothing's that. Nothing's been done? 
Yeah. They paid agents' fees on the way over. Of course, they said. Yeah. Agents. Can you get theirs back? I will. We, we have Please. To look at it, I don't know. You can go and speak to them, but they need their recruitment fees back. They said they have, they've, been, they've tried to get them back, but they said if they can play, they think they'll, they fear they'll get thrown out for their no, recruitment fees. Uh, we can, uh, this is obviously, as I mentioned, we've had a success with Can we speak to them about yeah, it? I'd, I'd love to. Can we? Yeah. Absolutely, let's do it. How are you? The recruitment fees issue, I understand some of the workers paid recruitment fees. Yeah. Anybody who has receipts, we can handle it. It's not a problem at all. And anybody who doesn't have receipts, we have a way of doing it. You've got your receipts for your agent's fees? They're going to get them for you. I can see there are things here that are good. There's a, there is a good spirit. You, saw, you see them playing football now. What they said was that actually they're managing and coping with the facility that they're in. But it's the fundamental principles of salary, of workers' rights, being able to switch jobs, that is fundamentally wrong. You cannot restrict people's right to move job. You cannot pay people that lower salary. It, and it'd be right. it's not right. And some of these are Western companies. We are part of the problem. We, we can't just sit here and say, oh, it's them. It's, we're all, we all tolerate this. So we'll go back to our nice hotel tonight. We'll have nice food. I'll go home on Saturday and I'll watch a game of football and I'll be a Premier League commentator and get on with my life. And those lads will be here. There is one accusation which threatens to overshadow the whole World Cup. The most damaging thing for Qatar is that construction workers are dying, working on the World Cup stadiums being built. It is the most damaging accusation that has been levelled at Qatar and something that I just can't quite believe. The International Trade Union Confederation have projected that 4,000 migrant workers will die in Qatar before a ball is kicked. It's an astonishing number of people, it's horrific. The idea that people building the World Cup stadiums that football fans are going to enjoy will have died in such great numbers. Can that be true? The truth is we don't know. What we do know is that, of course, there are workers who are, who are dying in Qatar. Um, those numbers are not published. We don't have good information on them. And I think it's quite important that the Qatari authorities are more open about what's going on, because that's the only way that, that this can be improved. There's this number that's floating around about how many workers have died on construction of World Cup stadiums. Can you, uh, answer, can you answer that three, question? Three work-related deaths have occurred, unfortunately. Just to clarify, it's three work-related deaths, and non-work-related deaths is about how many right now? 22 non-work-related non deaths. What does non-work-related deaths mean? Non-work-related deaths is not on site, uh, not while performing a work. The number of 4,000 deaths is inaccurate. Uh, you know, they basically took the, from what I recall, I think they took all the deaths that occurred in the country, labor-related, non-labor-related, workers, non-workers, and so on, and then they multiplied it uh, over the years, you know, to come, and, and they got to the 4,000 uh, deaths. And it was a number that was reported all over the world. There is a real struggle to find out what the real number is. But at the moment, we can't disprove the number of three, and we certainly can't prove the number of 4,000. Do we believe that on those sites, in front of Western project managers, that workers are dying and they're hiding it? Are we really saying that that's happening? I find that difficult to believe, because I've got more faith in people. We will have to wait for the final figure. But in the meantime, what awaits the fan traveling to Qatar to experience this World Cup? Can this small nation react to the biggest of the biggest events? Can it cope with the hundreds of thousands of people that are going to descend upon it? How are they going to deal with the issue of alcohol? How are they going to deal with the issue of fan behavior on streets? Qatar has won a World Cup. It has to have done this level of planning. Qatar is the smallest country ever to host the World Cup, which means it will be the most compact competition ever. All the stadiums are within an hour of each other, so fans can watch two or maybe three games a day. It has got the potential to be the best World Cup for a fan in terms of the actual travelling times and the distances to games and the fact you can stay in one location. I remember when England fans in the knockout phases of a tournament, they don't know which hotels to book, they can't plan where to be. 
they're guessing all the time. You know, which, which ground they're going to be at next. Are they going to finish first? Are they going to finish second? This is just simple. You're here in one place and you don't have to move. That is something that's never happened. It's not just the fans who'll benefit from less travel, it'll be good for the players too. A great World Cup for a player is down to, firstly, the football. Do you play well? Do you win? Second thing is, are you comfortable in the training ground? Are you comfortable in the hotel? You talk about the triangle. We talked about the triangle always with England. The hotel, the training ground, the airport. They've always got to be within 20 minutes of each other. You don't want to be an hour to training, an hour back, an hour to the airport, an hour back. I think there's a potential for this to be a great World Cup for players. One man who should know is Wesley Schneider, the former Ajax, Inter Milan and Real Madrid midfield player who's been playing and living in Qatar. You've played in three World Cups. You've played in Germany, no. the, one in, the one in South Africa and the one in Brazil. What will this World Cup be like compared to, say, the ones you've played in? Well, it's going to be a bit easier. I mean, like, you don't have to travel. Uh, you know, that's always, it's always hard when you play a game and then you have to play a game in another city and you, you need to travel and you're always moving. And now you, you will be based on, in one hotel, you will, be, you will be based in one spot. So I wish I could be in this, in this World Cup because, you know, to, to, to be based on one place and, and yeah, like with all the fans around you and, and, and with the other teams around you, it's going to be like one big family. What would your message be to Dutch fans that are travelling to this World Cup, if, if Holland get there? Yeah, well, I, th I think they will. <laughs> but, but, well, yeah, what is the message? Like, enjoy it, because, you know, uh, the people who have never been here, they, they have a bad image of, of, of Qatar, you know? And in November, December, the, the weather, weather is perfect, so they're going to have a lot of fun. everything you want for fans honestly this this is absolutely perfect streets like this atmosphere ambience good weather let's negotiate on this how much for an Englishman to have the World Cup squares like this you can see being full of the Brazilian samba dancers the Mexican bands the Colombians I can just feel them I remember it in in Russia and thinking how brilliant it was and it will happen here I'm sure. Can we see it? Can I hold it? We're English, we don't win the World Cup very often. <laughs> I think this will be the place to be during the World Cup for fans. If you think of Red Square, Moscow, how successful that was in the last World Cup. This is the Qatar Red Square. <laughs> Joking aside, Fitting fans from 32 different countries into a small space raises some big issues, like security. Will you be working in the World Cup? Yes. You will? Yes. Is this tournament going to be safe for fans? It is a new sort of challenge for Qatar. They're used to a big influx of migrant workers to help build up the country, but they've never had hundreds of thousands of fans there in one place. As a part of our security plan, we were working very, very closely with, for example, the Home Office in England, with the Gendarmerie in France, with Interpol, to make sure that we identify the hooligans early on, identify the troublemakers early on, and stop them from coming into Qatar. The biggest logistical problem I can see at the moment is travel. How is this transport infrastructure going to cope with the huge influx of fans? The traffic, even on a day like today, it's just before 9 o'clock in the morning now, um, but the traffic is a problem here. Qatar is busy widening roads and building new ones. And there's another innovation. The whole success of this tournament from a fan experience point of view depends upon this metro. Day pass, adult, pay. First impressions are good, but if fans are going to be able to watch the two, three games a day which Qatar promise, oh, we're in, then it's going to have to perform. We're on. The Metro's been purpose-built for the World Cup and it connects every single stadium with the longest journey, a maximum of 40 minutes. You'd give your right arm for something like this in England, running between city to city, football stadium to football stadium. One thing worth mentioning, there is one carriage where men are not allowed, it's women only. 
and that's something that during the World Cup fans are going to have to make sure they're careful about. This station is Alwa So when the fans land here at Al Wakra Metro Station, they'll then get on one of the buses. The ticket's still valid, and it's a 15-minute bus journey over towards Al Janoub Stadium. This stadium opened a few weeks ago. You can see there's still a little bit of work going on the roof there. One thing I have no doubts about is the ability of Qatar to deliver. They will build incredible stadiums that will support the World Cup. But one of the things that I'm really struggling with at the moment, there is nowhere near enough accommodation. They're talking about building more hotel rooms. At the moment, they're well short. Can you give us assurances that, that it's going to be affordable accommodation for fans of, of different countries? Yes, it will be. I mean, there's going to be accommodation for every type of fan. Just in the next 12 months, we have about 21 hotels that are near completion. Uh, we're looking uh, to have between 8,000 to 12,000 rooms from cruise ships or floating hotels as you call them. Also, we've seen fans pitch tents that are attending World Cups. Fans from South America were pitching tents in Brazil. So why not offer them something similar to that here in the desert? You come to Qatar and you see the skyscrapers, the modern buildings, the architecture, but the majority of this country is just sand. I've been coming to the Middle East now since 2001, and I actually have done quite a few of the activities before in terms of the camel riding, the sort of dune bashing, at the falconry, and it is things I think that fans will like to do when they're over here. Some won't. <laughs> Some would want to see the bottom of a Carlsberg tin. It's worth doing. I mean, I'm not a great fan of the dune bashing because I get car sick. I don't like heights on camels, and I don't like birds on my shoulder, so I'm not the best person to ask about these things, but I'm willing to demonstrate it for the day. Football's the top sport in Qatar, but falconry runs it close. It's moving a little bit. These birds are worth a fortune. How much? They cost. It's different price. One million real. Oh, it's about yeah, two million real. Oh, and whoa. some birds, uh, some That's falcon... hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah. How yeah. much this one? This one, ten thousand. Real. 000, yeah. Oh, it's about a thousand pounds. Yeah. This one's a, so it's a yeah, cheap, this, cheap. Yeah, it's, it's a right back. Cheap, yeah, yeah. It's the right back of falconry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Here we, go, here we go. Here we go. Sit down. Excellent. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard. Oh, oh, what's he doing? It's okay. It's okay, everything's fine. <laughs> I think fans from countries that aren't used to this will absolutely love it. Particularly the ones who are staying out in the desert in these tented villages. That's the beauty of the World Cup. When you think about where we were in Red Square in Russia, when you think of it coming to Qatar and this desert environment, completely different. Something stuck in me. <laughs> I think it's a camel hump. <laughs> I'm a warrior. No need for that. You can have fun here, but you mustn't forget you're in a conservative country and that throws up some cultural considerations for fans. This message I want to give to all the fans around the world, like enjoy the moment here because it, it's great, and, but behave because it's, it's not your country. It's not uh, Holland, for example, you know, it's, it's different. So I hope that, that the fans are coming over, they, they will accept the culture. Will the fans respect the fact that they're in a country that is incredibly religious, that has different beliefs. How is Qatar going to adapt to the fan? How is the fan going to need to adapt to Qatar? And how does it become what this image shows here, a festival? The number one thing in a World Cup is football. 
The second is the atmosphere that's created. Qatar have to be the home for the world for that month, and it's important fans know what can they expect when they go over there. Alcohol, behaviour of fans, we all know what's right and wrong generally in our own country, but what's acceptable and what's going to be acceptable over in Qatar for that month. We're about to enter into one of the newest mosques that's just been built in Doha, it's huge. And from an architectural point of view, it's absolutely stunning. I have to be honest with you, I don't go to church on a weekend, so it's the first time that I've ever been in a mosque before. There's no doubt Qatar's a deeply religious country. So what does that mean for fans coming over in 2022? I think there is this kind of perception that the Middle East is a bit kind of, you know, either oppressive or it's kind of going to be difficult for Westerners. People need to come and check it out for themselves. There's just the general stereotype of like Arabs and Muslims, but it's a very diverse culture. It's not as uh, like it may be portrayed on the media. Well, the first ever visit to a mosque, and all I come out of it thinking about is the fact that people love football. The people talk about football, we'll have, want to have photographs with you even during the prayers, which was very surprising to me. Football tears down walls, breaks down boundaries. You have to forget about what colour you are, what religion you are, where you come from. Football is a global language that everyone can participate in. For a World Cup to be a success, it always helps if the host nation does well. And if Qatar do make it out of the group stages, it'll be thanks to this place. The Aspire Academy is a £4 billion state-of-the-art sporting facility and home to the Qatar national team. Hi, it's Gary Neville. I'm here to see Ivan Bravo. We came here in 2010. This is Sir Alex Ferguson's signature. My recollection was that the weather was good. It was, it's always nice to get away from, obviously, the winter weather in England, and the facilities here are world-class. It's absolutely top-notch. We're off to meet Ivan Bravo, a gentleman who left Real Madrid as director of strategy to come and orchestrate the running of this place. So it's great to be here. What a facility. Is this your vision? No, no, no. This is the vision of the leaders of the country, which uh, it's, it's an amazing vision. I think when you see the facility, you might, uh, I also think, there's probably nothing like this in, in anywhere around the world. We have some of the best minds in football, some of the best coaches, people who, who left clubs like Real Madrid, like Man United, like Barcelona, uh, and they came here because they thought the impossible is possible. How important is this facility in the development of a successful Qatar national team? I always say if this place was not here, it would have to be invented uh, for Qatar because we have 5,800 registered players in the country, Okay. period. That is less than my neighbourhood in Madrid. My club, uh, my neighbourhood club in Madrid has more registered players yeah. than that. If you have a small country with only 5,800 players, you need to have a centralised place. The work at Aspire is starting to pay off. In 2019, Qatar won the Asian Cup, beating the likes of South Korea and then Japan in the final. My England debut was against Japan in 1995 at Wembley. And if you'd said to me Qatar would be beating them in an international, I would have said no chance. Seven of the successful side are graduates of the Aspire Academy, including Bassam Al Rawi and Tarek Salman. No one accept us to win the Asian Cup because, you know, like Qatar is a small, small country that no one knows if, but uh, we make it and also we make everyone in, in Qatar proud of us. So we cannot stop now. We can, we, this is the beginning, as you can say, for the 2022, so we need to be ready. Do you think about the World Cup now every day? Is that, is that in the back of your mind every time you play football, every time you train? It's a dream for everyone like, to play the World Cup. So it's going to be something amazing that we play in our home. And uh, I hope we can do something special for uh, the country. Because we are playing here with our fans, with, uh, with everyone here. And this is something special for every Arab. What's the dream draw? We want some teams that uh, we can beat. <laughs> England? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who would you like to play against? For me, Spain. Spain? Spain, yeah. And who would you like to play against? I'd like to play Brazil. Brazil? Yes. All the best. You're going to support us? Or? After England. <laughs> <laughs> All the best. Victory in the Asian Cup sparked scenes of wild celebration, and it's got everyone talking about 2022. But the question remains, will all supporters be welcome? 
Qatar are near the bottom of the league table when it comes to LGBT rights. Also, they've fallen out with some of their closest neighbours. In 2017, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Egypt cut diplomatic relations with Qatar. They imposed a blockade on the country by land, air and sea. A political standoff on the eve of the world's biggest football tournament. Hardly ideal. The World Cup in Qatar was supposedly going to bring the region together. But at the moment, there are some political issues with the blockade. How is that going to affect or impact the World Cup as an event? We're talking about four specific countries that decided to uh, cut off their ties uh, with Qatar. We hope that this will be an opportunity for them to revisit, rethink, even those who are now taking a very hostile stance towards Qatar, they're more than welcome. The perception of Qatar internationally is that there will potentially be restrictions, say for instance, for fans who are gay. Is that going to be something that you're going to again relax during the World Cup? Gary, let's remember one thing. I mean, you've, you've entered uh, Hamad International Airport, Qatar's airport. Did anyone ask you about the, your gender identity? No, but if there were open displays of, of, of behaviour that you saw or that the security forces saw during the World Cup from fans who were gay, what would happen to them? This is not about uh, being uh, LGBT or not. This is about exposing affections in public places. Yeah. It could be a man and a woman. I mean, it doesn't have to be um, LGBT or anything. I mean, we respect certain cultural elements and we expect the others also to respect our culture and identity. Again, the perception externally is that women are suppressed in Qatar. There are a lot of women that will be travelling to this World Cup. Have you got a message for them? No, absolutely. I'm not suppressed. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Definitely. But that's the perception externally. Absolutely. I, I totally understand that there are certain stereotypical images that we want to break. And this is why we think the World Cup is an opportunity to do that. To break stereotypes, by the way, not only about women, about our region. I mean, our region is not about war. Our region is not about blood. Our region is not about violence. Our region is about love, about peace. We have a great legacy, and it will be wonderful in the World Cup 2022. You're very sure of that, aren't you? Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> the general approach is fair and reasonable, that you know people should be aware of where they're at, people should be aware of the, of the country they're in, people should be aware of the culture. However, these are football fans who are coming here highly charged, passionate, some of them under the influence of alcohol, and you're going to need to give them very clear instructions. Affection in public places, is it allowed? When it comes to the issue of public display of affection, we are a conservative nation. So the public display of affection isn't part of our culture, uh, regardless of your sexual orientation. So all we're saying is for people to understand that and appreciate that. Of course, you know, what is acceptable or not, we will definitely communicate to the world. For example, you know, a hug, you know, a simple kiss, you know, is, is, is not going to be an issue. With all the politics, you wonder where football fits in. I've got no doubt there is a great passion for football in the Middle East. I've been over here with training camps and played different games. And they know players inside out like you wouldn't believe. Football is, is part and parcel of who we are. It's, it's in our DNA. I mean... We are a football crazy nation. If you go from all the way to the top and all the way to the bottom within the entire sphere of our society, we love this game. The way football started for us was, um, you know, people who worked in the oil and gas industry at the time, and I believe it was Shell, if I'm not mistaken, that was in Qatar. People saw the expats effectively playing two kinds of sports. Cricket, football, football won. Well, I wanted to come down. It's, Qatar are playing Afghanistan in under 23s game. Well, you've got the call for prayer in the background. Got the call for prayer comes regularly. It'll happen during matches. It's something you get used to. One thing you do have to notice around: you can't see too many female Qataris in the stadium. There are a lot of male. There are some. I can see five or six over there, but there aren't too many. That's interesting in terms of the fans. They've just come alive and now started to engage. They've got some local instruments. That's going to take off. There's no doubt that the European fans, the South American fans, will play right into that. They'll work with it, I'm sure. I saw enough at this under-23s game to suggest there will be a great atmosphere in 2022. 
but there's one missing ingredient. Alcohol is absolutely vital for any sporting competition in the sense that you're just not going to get away without people consuming it. It's part of the fan experience of many countries, not of every country, but of many countries. Qatar, we know, has a very strict policy around alcohol. It's only available in five-star hotels, but there just has to be a little bit of relaxation. Will alcohol be served in fan zones? Yes. Not all the fan zones, but in certain designated fan zones, alcohol will be served. We'll have other fan zones where alcohol will not be served. Some are family-orientated and family-focused, uh, but alcohol will be served in certain fan zones, absolutely. I bought a beer in the hotel last night at 16 pounds. Oh. That isn't going to be tolerated or accepted by football fans. Even for me, it shocked me. What is the cost of a pint going to be in this World Cup? So we'll definitely make sure and we'll work towards ensuring that alcohol is served at a reasonable price. You know, you mentioned that uh, pints in, in you know, Britain, for example, are being sold for four to five pounds. Whatever a fan coming from England or a fan coming from Peru or a fan coming from Mexico will have a reasonably priced uh, pint in their hands, absolutely. What is the Qatar World Cup going to be like in 2022? From a football point of view, this tournament could be incredible. The stadiums are amazing, the infrastructure is world class. This does have the potential to be a memorable World Cup from a fan point of view. But those allegations of corruption, the controversy surrounding the workers' rights and accommodation, those questions are going to go on and on and on, probably until the tournament starts. What kind of World Cup will Qatar deliver? We're going to find out in 2022.